For this module, we're looking at the two readings as a way to introduce some of the core groundwork, core questions about ethics, and to address some common issues we tend to run into when we speak about ethics, especially in a comparative environment. Two notes before we get started. First, we have already covered the issue of ethics and law in an earlier reading, so please refer to that reading for any law-related issues. Second, the approach that we'll be taking is the metaphysical one, including the reliance on the struktura to clarify exactly how various ethical theories are structured. On to the readings. We start with the selection from Plato's The Republic. In this selection, we focus on the part of Book 2. Now, this was our focus because it is in this section that the main question for the entire book is posed, and the limits of the discussion are laid out. Here, we will focus on the layout presented on the nature and ordering of values, justice and human nature, and then move on to the question about whether justice is inherently good. You'll notice that the reading also gives us this neat little division of activities into three groups. Group A are things that are good in themselves. You want happiness because happiness is good in itself. Group B is things that are good on their own and have a benefit. So you want health because health is good in itself, but it also gives you other benefits. And group C, things that are disagreeable, but are good for their results. You don't want to watch what you eat, but you do because it gets you healthy. The way to think of this difference is in terms of answering the why question. You're in school. Why? Because you want to get a degree. Why? So that you can get a job. Or maybe go on to a professional school, but then get a job. Why? So you can make money. Why? So that you can get the things you want, material things or status or something else. Why? So that you can be happy. Why? Now notice that the last why stops making sense. Why do you want to be happy? Because being happy is good in itself. There is no further explanation needed. If someone kept asking you why happiness is good, you would be pretty sure that they didn't understand the meaning of happiness. But before we got to happiness, there were a bunch of other steps. Getting at least some things you want is usually good in itself and has a benefit. You want health because health lets you do other things, but also because the absence of health sucks. Same can be said of education. Education is good in itself. It enriches you as a person, it ennobles you, as the earlier article noted, but it also has a benefit of allowing you to get a job. And then we get to the job and money. Work for money is not a good. It is disagreeable, but it gets us the things we want. So it is a medium to get us the things we want. But what about the people who love what they do, you might be wondering? Well, they enjoy their work, but not working for money. These are people that if you gave them enough money to never need to work again, they would still do what they do. Examples are Bill Gates or Elon Musk, because to them, money ultimately is an obstacle. They only need more of it so that they can do their job, and if they could magically cut out the money, they would. Think about you. If you got a genie that followed you around and whatever you wanted that could be paid for by money, the genie just gave it to you. Would you still want money? No. Would you want to work for money? Definitely not. Money is a medium a product we only want because it lets us get the things we actually want. If you were deathly ill, would you want money? No, you would want health. And if money could buy you health, would you give up the money for health? Of course you would. This ties into our metaphysical layout and the idea of sacrifice. Anything that you spend money on is actually higher in your hierarchy of values than money is. That's why you sacrifice money to get those other things. That's the idea behind paying for things. Next, the Republic puts forward an argument that lays out human desires and goods in three stages. Stage 1. All people want to do injustice. That means that doing injustice is the best option we can see. It is the thing we want, but we can't necessarily get it. So what exactly is meant by doing injustice? Well, simply put, doing injustice is getting disproportionate benefits. Disproportionate benefit is the idea that you, what you get is more than what you've actually earned. We want to get paid as if we're working even though we're slacking off. We want to win the lottery. I give you $5 and you give me $300 million back. We want to get great grades without studying. We want to be famous without doing anything. 
We want to lose weight, but also eat whatever we want. We want to look like The Rock, but without the effort that The Rock puts in. That is disproportionate benefit. The thing is, nothing is free. So if you're getting disproportionate benefit, someone else is not being appropriately rewarded. That is, they are suffering injustice. And that brings us to the second issue. No one wants to suffer injustice. Injustice is simply disproportionate loss. That means suffering injustice is the worst option that we can see. It's the thing we want to avoid, but we can't necessarily manage to avoid it. Imagine you're saving up $100,000 for some reason. It takes you five years of grueling work, you take on an extra job, you save all the money, you deny yourself simple pleasures all in the name of saving up, etc. And after five years, you take your duffel bag full of money and head off to buy whatever it is that you wanted to buy. And then, someone steps out in front of you with a gun and takes away your five years of grueling effort in under 60 seconds. They got the disproportionate benefit. You got the disproportionate loss. Now, we can't all do injustice. And more importantly, since we cannot avoid having injustice done to us, we get together and we make a pact. We give up our freedom to do injustice in return for everybody else giving up that same freedom. And now, no one does injustice, so no one suffers injustice. And then we enforce this agreement with collective force. That is, I may not be able to prevent someone else doing injustice to me, but as a collective, we can do so. The point of this setup is to indicate that justice is not something we actually think is good in itself. Instead, the argument says, justice is something like a necessary evil. No one wants it, but we put up with it because the alternative, suffering injustice, is worse. It's kind of like watching what you eat. We all want to eat whatever we feel like, whenever we feel like, and as much as we feel like. No one likes counting calories. But if you don't watch what you eat, you end up with severe health problems and diabetes and so on. So what we want is to do whatever we want. What we don't want is to be deathly ill. So watching what you eat is a way to avoid the worst outcome. But it comes at the cost of giving up your freedom to do what you want. So it's not what anybody actually wants, but it's what we do so that we avoid the worst outcome. This argument was later made by Thomas Hobbes, a very famous philosopher, and he argued that the basis of society is this trading in of freedom for security. And we don't do this because freely engaging in murder and rape is bad, he says, but because we can't effectively protect ourselves from the same actions done by others. So we get together and we trade in that freedom for security, and then we enforce that security collectively. Now the question of the position of justice can really be understood as a result of this layout. If the argument here is correct, then justice, or being good, is not good in itself, our category A. It's not even good in itself with benefits, category B. Instead, it's the thing that is disagreeable, but which we do for its benefits, category C. Now, why does this matter? Well, categories A and B are the kinds of things you actually want. That is, they are the kinds of things that don't really depend on their consequences or outcomes. You want them because of what they are, not because of what they do. Category C is the kind of thing we don't want. We don't want that thing. We only want its consequence. But that raises a serious problem. Anytime we can get the thing we actually want, the consequence, without having to do the thing we don't like, the actual work, we will skip the work and go straight to the consequence. Wordy, I know, so let's make it a little easier. Anytime you can have money without having to work for it, you will take the money. Anytime you can look like The Rock without having to work out like The Rock, you will take it. In other words, the actual activity is really an obstacle. It's something that we want to avoid, and we will avoid it just as soon as we can get away with it. If justice is this kind of thing, then the only reason to be just is because we're too weak or incapable or frankly stupid to be unjust, because injustice is what we actually want. The only correct thing to desire, according to this argument, is to be as unjust as you can be. 
and justice is only for the weak, inept, and the stupid. Now Plato, or rather Socrates, take the flip position. They argue that justice is actually good in itself. And here we get the final thought experiment. To prove that justice is really good in itself, Socrates has to show how the most just person is better off than the most unjust person. And this is a question that he's going to spend the rest of the book answering. Well, the argument goes like this. Imagine the most unjust person. They are a liar, a cheat, a thief, a murderer, if need be, a rapist, if they feel like it, etc. And they engage in all the activities where they're able to get a disproportionate benefit. But, and here's the catch, they are so good at being unjust that everyone else in the entire society thinks that they are actually the most just person ever. And so they get all the external benefits of being just. So everyone loves them, everyone wants to be their friend, everyone wants their kids to be just like this person. The people in power want him to marry into their family, they have job offers from everyone, they are awash in money, they have the highest social status, etc. Now let's imagine the most just person. They never take disproportionate benefit, even if it's offered. They're always on the straight and narrow. They actively work to ensure that everyone else is protected from any injustice. They might even forego some of their own deserved benefits if they so much as appear to possibly be shady. But, and here's the catch again, the whole society thinks that they are the most unjust person ever. Again, this is designed to take the idea of external benefits out of the equation. So everyone hates them and no one wants to be associated with them in any way. They are the cautionary tale and the scary story people tell their kids. They have no access to work because no one will hire them. They are beyond broke and they have no social status. And then as a cherry on top, they're vilified and falsely accused of lying, cheating, theft, murder, rape, pedophilia, and so on. They are finally lynched and die a horrible death. This extreme comparison is intended to force Socrates to defend the idea of the goodness of justice as being goodness in itself. And that means without any ability to connect that goodness to any kind of external benefit. In fact, the harm to be suffered for being just means that the goodness of justice must itself be greater than all of that harm. Now, I won't spoil the rest of the book for you by telling you how Socrates replies, but it is a great thought experiment. You can try it yourself. How can justice, or any other value you think should be considered as the highest moral value, answer a question like this? Now, of course, we care about this thought experiment because it takes some of these vague ideas like goodness and forces them into a very tough situation where the answer cannot be vague. You can either explain how the most just person is better off than the most unjust person, or you have to give up your entire claim about justice, or whatever highest moral value you happen to have. It also forces you to articulate what exactly is goodness, and how and why you understand it that way, and how those ideas actually work in practice. As a side note, we tend to think of examples like this as crazy unrealistic. But I want you to understand that these are real cases. People like Stalin or Hitler or Mao were all highly admired. They were given prominent social positions and given accolades for their wealth. They had everything. On a slightly less genocidal level, you have Bill Cosby, who was a beloved comedian and had money and status and all the rest of that. Now, some of these people managed to ride out this perception until their death, and others got caught. But getting caught is no argument against being unjust. If getting caught were an argument against being unjust, it would actually just be an argument against being inept in being unjust. Because if they were smarter, they would have gotten away with it. And the question is, why is being just better than being unjust? Not, why is being just better than being unjust and getting caught? Now for our second reading on altruism, we definitely go back to metaphysics and struttura. As noted, the problem with looking for altruism is the definition of the term. The idea that 
we should be doing good for others without caring about ourselves, and especially doing good for others at a cost to yourself that cannot be recouped. But when we look at the metaphysical notion of highest moral value, which is where we get the whole idea of values and their ordering from, it turns out that what we mean by good is whatever is leading us towards our highest moral value, and bad is whatever is leading us away from that goal. That is, the very notion of good and bad rests on whether it is of benefit to us or not. The idea of altruism then requires that there is some magically universally agreed upon notion of goodness, there isn't, and we know this because different people, cultures, and civilizations have very different and mutually exclusive ideas of goodness. There might be some actual universal idea of goodness, but we don't have any agreement on what that would be. But even if there was an agreed upon universal idea of goodness, then that idea would have to be part of everyone's highest moral value, and that would mean that being altruistic is still of benefit to you. And by definition of altruism, doing anything that benefits you is not altruistic. We tried to get around this problem by turning the system into a question of materialistic benefits and sacrifices, but that just ends up in a contradiction as well. The idea, as far as I can see, is that altruism does not make sense. You're either doing good, which means that you're inherently deriving benefit, or you're doing things that you think are bad, but someone else thinks are good which means that, as far as you're concerned, you're not doing good, you're doing evil. If, instead, we focus on the metaphysical layout, we see that the goodness depends on your highest moral value, and so any goodness is always your own benefit. And, of course, there are sacrifices we make of lower-tier values to advance our higher-tier values, but that's just a matter of moral investing into achieving your highest moral value in general. On the one hand, this sounds cold and calculating. On the other hand, it allows us to actually make sense of what we mean by goodness and moral behavior. By understanding the sacrifice as a long-term investment in your own goals, the behavior suddenly makes sense from a logical perspective. Finally, all this may seem to point to hard moral relativism, which is the everyone decides what's right and wrong for them, and who are you to tell anyone else that they're right or wrong kind of position. That's not the case. Recall that in metaphysics, we already established two principles by which we can judge metaphysical systems, even though they are axiomatically based, and axioms don't require justifications because you assume them. There was the internal coherence method, do your ideas work with each other, or do they end up in a contradiction and paradox? Next, if the internal coherence was good, there was the external coherence, does your system functionally map onto the real world? And now, we get to the third method of analysis, social functionality. When we talk about social functionality, we're really talking about whether a system can be functional, stable, dynamic, sustainable, and scalable over time in a social context. Now, most of this was the definition of harmony in metaphysics, so what exactly is new? Well, consider a kid playing a game with other kids. Now, a kid who loses the game badly enough, especially a sore loser, will not be invited to play the game again. No one wants the kid who threw a tantrum and wrecked the game to come back. The parents might force them to play with that kid, but as soon as the other kids have anything to say about it, Tantrum Timmy is going to be socially rejected. Now that's not new because Timmy was already a loser in the game, so the external coherence of his idea had failed. But there's another more insidious option. We've all seen Sore Winner. That kid that wins, but then gloats, belittles others, etc., because he won. Well, guess what? Jackass Jack is not getting invited to play any more games either. And this is a catch. Even though Jack had a functional internal and external coherence for this game, he failed at the social functionality element. This is the sort of secret level aspect that was not directly covered before, but which is an inherent part of any system. And that is that the key part of functionality is long-term functionality. That is, you don't only want to win, you want to be in a position to keep winning. And that means that in victory, or in loss, you want to be invited to play the next game, and the next one after that, and all the other games across the spectrum of human existence and potential. Winning now, if it means that you can't play the game ever again, is actually a loss. The way you keep getting invited to play again is by making sure that your metaphysics have a social functionality factor properly built in. 
in terms of ethical systems, systems that only have some kind of self-benefit as their highest moral value are inevitable losers. And we should have anticipated this because the functionality and sustainability elements, when combined, tell us exactly that. Long-term ability to have the world behave as you want it to behave is ultimately dependent on others because we are social creatures. And therefore, your highest moral value has to have a social benefit aspect to it or you will be rejected and kept out of society. We care about these issues because they form a core set of problems that we face in ethics. We tend to talk about right and wrong as if it is obvious to everyone and as universally agreed upon as the fact that things fall down. That's not the case. While you may have a strong moral compass, we need to acknowledge that others have it too and that their ideas may not be compatible with yours. The point is not that you should think of their ideas as being equally good as yours are. That would be belittling your own moral ideas. Imagine if you believe that pedophilia is bad but then also thought that people who are pro-pedophilia and engage in it were as good as you are. That's terrible, and it's a staple of the most incoherent parts of moral relativism. Instead, you need to understand those ideas just as well as the people who believe in them, or even better than they do. And you need to understand how they hold these ideas, what they mean, where they lead, and how they are applied in the world, and what that means. Only in this way can we coherently engage in conversation and discussion on ethical issues, and ultimately, all issues are, at least in part, ethical issues. In terms of metaphysics, it's critical to understand that our ethics and ethics of others are all inherently based on a set of axiomatic assumptions. Axioms are the core assumptions we are forced to make in order to do anything. For example, we assume that there is a right and wrong, or that reason can and should be relied on, as per our reading of El Ghazali. That means that telling someone that they have the wrong axioms is no different than telling them that they're wrong about what their favorite flavor of ice cream is. There is no way to get at axioms directly, so if someone else has a different axiom than you do, your job should be to understand them. But what about people who are very wrong? People who support genocide and such? Well, again, Telling them that they're wrong does nothing, so why bother? But there is something that we can do. Understand them. Once you understand that side, no matter how repugnant you find it to be, there are several options you have. You can try to see if you can break their system with internal coherence analysis or an external coherence analysis. You can also find ways of arguing against their bad behavior by using their own theory. If their behavior is out of joint with their stated beliefs, you can demonstrate that and then you force them to either change their behavior or to give up their theory or find a way around your argument. Or you can argue for changing their behavior based on their axioms. For example, instead of arguing whether climate science is correct with someone whose axiomatic belief it is that humans can't meaningfully alter divine creation, you can read up on the idea of stewardship like taking care of things that you're entrusted with, and then use that approach. Suddenly, keeping pollution down is in line with the axioms that the person actually believes in. And quite honestly, who cares whether or not they believe in climate science so long as their behavior matches what you're trying to do. This approach does two things for us. First, it makes sure that we actually understand what's going on, meaning that we're responding, not reacting. The very act of engaging with someone's beliefs like this makes them less defensive. The key, though, is that you have to sincerely want to understand what they're saying. So put your reactions aside and go learn. Second, it gives us actually good tools to use, the kind of tools that actually do something. Once you have a solid understanding of the system from the inside, you understand all the ways in which it does and doesn't work all the ways in which it can be used to align with your own goals without being malicious about it. The idea here isn't to trick people, but to show them a more comprehensive view of things that they themselves believe in. This lets you work with people's ideas, no matter what they are, to advance your own ideas as well as their own. This is the part where we tend to miss the point the most. We try to remake people in our own image. That is, we want others to be just like we are. 
but we also resent anyone who tries to do that to us. So it is logical that they too would resent us for trying to do the same thing to them. Instead of trying to change who people are, find a way to make them a better version of themselves. You would be okay or happy if someone worked with you to make you better. So return the favor. Make other people better. It doesn't matter if you agree on everything. You can usually find a decent common ground and work on that. And because people are not opposed to that, this approach is far more likely to work than any other.